to the cloud and also uh, live on, no, where's that? Okay, live transcript and enable. Okay, I've turned on live transcription. Okay, uh, what are your questions, Thomas? Uh, when I use the uh, MAN function within the virtual machine and type in some of the things like uh, MVADDCH, it doesn't show up. What does it mean? Uh, some of the functions within your, do you want me to clarify? Also, I don't think we can hear you right now. Uh, professor? We can't hear you. If we're having issues, I can only imagine what other departments are experiencing. No, it's just Apple. I mean, like, they like if an English professor is teaching a class <laughs> over Zoom, how are they? Hello. Hey, I think we can hear you now. Hello, you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I didn't do anything. Okay, so uh, where was I? Uh, we didn't hear any of your response. Should I repeat the question? Oh yeah, no, no, uh, I uh, at first didn't understand your question because I was thinking in terms of ARM assembly language, but now I totally get it as soon as I saw the transcription. So yes, you didn't see anything uh, because of the double buffering nature. Uh, so you have to do a refresh in order to see anything. What? Okay. What? So uh, for instance, so if you do a refresh, you'll see what you changed, but then again, uh, you know, don't erase the screen and do a refresh because you won't see anything. Uh, that's not what I was asking. Yeah. Well, uh, that's why I asked if you wanted me to repeat. Yes, you were asking that you said that you did a, a move add character and you no. didn't see the outcome. No, I didn't. You didn't then ask that. Okay, then add, okay. rephrase your question. Uh, in the virtual machine, we have the uh, function where we can pull up the MAN and we can search in a phrase like read or uh, something else, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, I did that on some of the function calls like erase or Mavadic or box or refresh or end win within mm -hmm. your C file for project four, but nothing came up. Okay, uh, that's because curses um, is not a. Uh, uh, it's some, not a part of Linux, really. It's yeah, and some Linux implementations you'll find it in the man pages, and others not. Uh, so what you can do besides searching online, uh, you can, if I remember right, there is a uh, package that you can install using apt that provides the man pages for curses. It's not built in. Uh, but I would recommend using the your browser to do the searching. All right. Let me see if I can't uh, find a good page for you. Uh, uh, not that one. That's also Python. Python. Uh, uh, this one. Invisibleisland.net. Um, let's go find that. Uh, so here's your manual. Right. Okay. Uh, 
I'll put that link in the chat. Uh, Chitty chat. Okay. Now let me uh, see who's here. Uh, okay, does anybody know where Jacqueline is? All right, if you are a, uh, a colleague or friend of uh, Jacqueline, please uh, let her know that she is missed. Wait, has she not been here frequently? Um, I'm looking for her. I must have a reason to do that. But when's the last time she's been here? Because I didn't actually know she was a thing. I can't, I can't say. Did she at least turn in her homework? That's, I can't talk about that, but all I can say is that I miss seeing her here. Okay. All right. So uh, what are we, you, you have other questions, Thomas? Uh, that answered all of them. Although all of my other questions are about initializing doubles and you're not gonna answer that anyways. Actually, uh, actually do I, I do know one thing I will ask about. Uh, what is COLS within line 13 of the C code you tossed us? Okay, the uh, curses package uh, creates and uh, fills in uh, a number of variables, in this case, uh, rows and calls. Uh, they are integers created by the curses package. They become valid only after init screen is executed. They are externs to your program. And curses.h, uh, the include file, contains the signature for those variables. Okay. Right, so calls is the columns line. Uh, yeah, lines and calls. So lines is the uh, number of lines. So when we're coding in assembly, it's we just move that into a register? Uh, well, it's, a, it's something in memory, right? So however it is that you have figured out to access the contents of memory, that's how you do it. All right. Okay, we have pleased Cephas. We're not sure what we did. It's just, do you know who Dr. Kwashnak is? Yes. Yeah, he sends us like messages about Schoology stuff and the amount of typos is absolutely amazing. Okay. Hmm. I do have a question. Um, and I, I hope you can answer. If not, I'm gonna cry. Um, so just with doubles, okay, I know how they work. Floating points, I know how they work. How do we, how? How do we write to the individual bits to create a float? Ah, well, uh, interesting. Uh, I'm surprised by the question because you don't have to do it for an assignment. And that totally breaks my my worldview of students only doing what's necessary to pass. So uh, hats off to you, you have me dumbfounded. Uh, so let's take a look, if I could, at the source code to the last program. Uh, let's see, what's an easy way to find it? Not sure, but, oh, wait, I already have this here. And um, let's go, and we have float, where's that? Uh, reference is where the source code is. No, it's Loadster not. is on Schoology. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, uh, so I've given you two versions, one that uses bit bashing directly and the other that uses bit fields. So if you have a, a struct that assembles the bit fields, you can write to those fields directly and construct your own uh, floating point number. Okay, so just remember 
that if it's a single precision, you need to offset the um, uh, exponent by 127. Okay. So that's a marvelous thing about the bit field syntax is that uh, you can treat them like any other int bit fields, like any other integer. Uh, writing to it, reading from it, and the compiler will generate the code necessary to do the bit ands and the bit ors to read from and write to just those bits. Okay. And with assembly, you can just use a bunch of special things that allow you to write to bits. There's a little right. section somewhere in here that I remember seeing. Yeah. Right. So Jordan, does that answer your question? Were you interested from the higher level language or from assembly language? I was interested more on assembly because like I know higher level languages make it easy, but I want to know what the basics are in assembly. Okay. Now there, the ARM instruction set does offer a number of bit field uh, manipulation instructions. However, if you keep it strictly, um, you know, uh, platform agnostic, all platforms have and, and all platforms have or, and all platforms have a shift. Right. So we are actually going to study in its own right, more bit bashing. So I, we could either wait until then, or I could just do a little bit of a teaser right now. Uh, let me, let me do the little bit of a teaser. And, um, okay. So, uh, so we've got a sign bit. And we have an exponent and we have a fraction. And uh, so that's uh, bit 31. And this is eight bits and this is 23 bits. All right. So if you wanted to extract the exponent, for example, so read the exponent, uh, suppose your um, floating point number is in S zero, right? S for single. Uh, I don't know if uh, floating point registers can be accessed by and, and and or and such like that. So I'd have to look that up. At worst, you would just transfer the S register over to an X register. And that's with a, a F move. Okay. So uh, suppose we wanted this to read from it. Read the exponent. So in pseudocode, it would be, um, you can do it in a number of ways. So you could shift right by 23 bits. Okay, then and you should give up, give up now already. So and with uh, 255. Okay, that's your exponent. Okay, now if you wanted to read, uh, that was reading the exponent. Now if you wanted to write the exponent, let's say, um, uh, you have uh, an 8-bit value. Uh, so you would take that, let's say it's in X something. Uh, so you would, uh, you have an 8, so for writing, you haven't, boy, I can't find my words today. Okay. So you have an 8-bit value. I have a question. Yes? So your question. Without is it right, worth interrupting me? Yes, definitely for sure. Okay, well in that case. <laughs> if you have the right shift, where those bits would generally be like poofed. Where, yes. or is it like moving it to temporary register so they're not poofed? No, no, they're gone. So when you read it, you destroy, well, that's not particularly useful. 
So you'd have to well, save it first or something, right? Uh, yeah, if it's important to you. Okay. Right. Okay, so to write an 8-bit value, uh, this is a good lesson because you have to read first and you have to flatten bits first and then you can or. So let me, let me show you uh, what I'm talking about. On this screen, let me rem re uh, remind you, you have the sine bit, you have the exponent, and then you have the fraction. That's 23 bits for single precision, eight bits and one bit. So uh, if you wanted to uh, change the exponent, but leave the fraction alone and the sign alone, you can't just overwrite with a new 8-bit value because that would be overwriting the whole single precision. So instead, you would have to um, so oh, I did it again. And uh, with the uh, eight bits at the exponent and and that was zero. Okay. So that now you've got the sine zero and the fraction and then you or in eight bits at the right bits for the exponent. Okay, so let's, that's the uh, uh, English explanation. Now let's look at it a little bit more detail. Uh, so you would take, um, Uh, you would take uh, zero, you would see you want to and it with zero. Uh, okay, I have to reorient my uh, head here. So let's see. Okay, so uh, what you want is a value, you want to construct a value that is uh, 23 ones, and then doesn't matter uh, what goes here, is has to be zeros, and then a one for the sine position. So a one in the sine area, zeros where the exponent would be, and then ones where the fraction would be. Anding with a one doesn't change the original value because uh, zero and one is still zero and a one and one is still one. So you're making a mask, which would be uh, four bits, eight bits, uh, 16 bits, 20 bits, then uh, three, three, no, 21, no, uh, seven. So, okay, so there is uh, 24 bits where the uh, zero here is bit uh, 24. So this is 23 bits worth of ones. And then you'd need uh, there's one zero there, so that makes five zeros, and then eight there. So this is the sine bit, and this is the fraction. So if you and this value to your floating point number, your floating point number will be unchanged except for the exponent which is, um, let's see, I think I'm missing a zero. No, I'm not. So there's, see, there's one here, four there, that makes five. And is it eight? Yeah, so three here. I'm correct. This is all correct. 
So the result of ending this with your floating point number would be to have zeros in only the uh, zeros in the exponent, all the other bits are left alone. Then to set the uh, new contents of the exponent, you'd have your eight bits. So your value shifted left by 23. And this value must be eight bits only. Shift it left by 23 and do an or. And now your, uh, your new value is going to be your new exponent and then the original fraction and the original sign. So reading, uh, you just have to mask off, but writing, uh, remember that you have to blast the, um, it's not sufficient to or in a new value. You have to blast the, the bits that are there to zero first, then you or in the new bits. Does that help, Jordan? All right, we're going to get a lot of practice doing this. So bit bashing is something that it's, it's its own subject in this class. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Where can we find a reliable source to explain bit bashing if we didn't fully understand it from your explanations so far? Well, we, you can do two things. Uh, one, you can search and um, uh, there are plenty of sources, but uh, two, perhaps you can just uh, wait a little bit and we'll get to it. Right. Okay. Uh, question? Yeah. When running, um your uh, project four file in assembly. Um, in the C example, you link both the curses library and the math library. Is there a math library in um, assembly and do I have to link it in order to use sign or is there already an implementation for sign? And would I have to install uh, library the same way? No, I just, uh, dash, uh, so the GCC, mm -hmm. the name of your code, and then dash L N curses or dash L curses uh -huh. doesn't matter. And then dash uh, space dash L M. And that'll let me be able to use sign as a call. Correct. Okay, cool. All right, so to link, you need two libraries. One uh, dash L M tells the linker to include the math library and then uh, dash L uh, and curses tells it to include curses. And that's before we try and even do anything with this program. I don't understand the question. When we, uh, when we do GCC. It's every time you compile, you need to link the two. Yeah, yes. So. And, and those dash L's come after, not before your source code file. Okay, so uh, remember that when you call GCC or G++, you're calling actually a suite of tools. Only one of them is the compiler. Uh, so on the command line, you've got options that are destined for the compiler and then options that are destined for the linker. So that's why the dash L's come after the name of your source code. Okay, other questions? Okay, so uh, today we are not going to talk about assembly language. Hooray, right? And uh, see what's going on in the chat. Bing, dang, you beat me to it. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Cephas, for the 
editorialization with which uh, I would not have been aware unless I happened to look. So if you, there's something you want me to comment on, you gotta say it out loud. Okay, so uh, let's get back to uh, the outline of what I wanna talk about. Uh, so I proactively filled in our progress. So we're gonna talk about disk drives and uh, we'll see how far we get. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, and let us begin. Uh, back here. Okay. So unfortunately for COVID, uh, you know, we're separated. Uh, this class, uh, one of the highlights of this class is where we tear apart obsolete computers. And by tear apart, I mean destructively tear apart obsolete computers that uh, the library uh, lo uh, loans to us. It's a one-way loan because the output of this process is the trash bin uh, because we have actually torn the pieces apart. So ordinarily, you'd get to open up a hard drive and look inside of it and see the parts that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so it's called a disk because it's uh, circular. Well, that, that, that part's easy. Unbelievable. For the second time in less than an hour, my uh, Apple Pencil has stopped talking to the iPad. That'll take one moment to fix. Never happened before. I don't know why it's happening now, but it's fast enough just to fix it. Calm yourself. Okay, so anyway, so there is a disc and it looks like a disc. It has a hole in the middle uh, around which it spins. Okay, so uh, discs are uh, ma magnetic discs uh, like the ones that are inside computers as opposed to let's say compact discs, CDs, DVDs, uh, are coated with a magnetic material. And also they are coated on both sides. So there'll be magnetic material here and here on both sides, the top and the bottom. So that means we've got uh, twice the capacity in a double-sided disc than we do in a single-sided disc. And this has been true since the, you know, floppies, for example. Uh, floppy disks were uh, single-sided or double-sided. And these were 440 kilobytes. And these were 880 kilobytes. So a double density, uh, a double-sided uh, double floppy had uh, less than one megabyte of capacity. What the hell are you doing, Cephas? Okay. Nothing? Yeah. You know, I've never actually encouraged someone to turn their camera off, but in your case, I think I'll make an exception. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. Now, Jordan, come on, admit it. That line should show up in the, the Facebook group. Sure. Yeah, I sorry, I was sharpening my pencil. I didn't hear what the line was. Oh, well, I've never encouraged anyone to turn off their camera, but in your case, I'll make an exception. All right, I will post that right now. Do people okay. have a Facebook group? Uh, there's a Facebook group for funny things that have been said on campus. Which, oh. uh, for, forgive me for being selfish, but or, or, um, uh, conceded, but I, I thought that was funny. You would, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. Okay, so um, grab a drink. So this disc that you see there is um, another word for it that's accurate is a platter. 
And uh, we're assuming that this is a double-sided platter and that the magnetic material is on both sides. Uh, this spins. Okay. Uh, now I happen to draw it counterclockwise, which uh, may or may not be correct. Um, I don't even know why I did it counterclockwise, but variety is the spice of life. So this spins, uh, and there is data uh, encoded in the magnetic material in concentric rings. So it is not like a phonograph record. Uh, phonograph is a thing that we used to listen to before uh, MP3. Okay. So uh, unlike a record, which is a spiral, these are truly concentric rings. Now, the data on the disk is uh, organized into sections called blocks. Now, typically, a hardware block size is 512 bytes. Now that is a, a hardware number. Typically, the logical block size is far larger, perhaps a minimum of 4096 block bytes. So there's a difference between the hardware block size and the logical block size. The logical block size being larger uh, means that it's more, more efficient and higher speed. So imagine uh, a disk is spinning and there's some read device that's called the heads. Uh, let's, uh, so this is showing a head above the platter and there's also a head below the platter. And these heads are uh, both the pickup device and the writing device. Okay. So as the disk spins, there's going to be a certain amount of latency or delay waiting for the right block to rotate to become under the heads. So this latency is called rotational latency. So the time in the worst case that you have to wait for the data to rotate under your head uh, is dependent upon the number of revolutions per minute of the disk. So a typical hard drive spins at 7200 RPM. So that would be a typical rotation speed. Would not the reads, the speed also depend upon the specific location of the data since it's a cycle? So the closer it is to this center, the faster it necessarily spins. And the further on the outside, like it takes, wait, 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 wait. Remembering physics, that period is the same, isn't it? Ooh. Basically. Okay, so some crappy hard drives, namely the ones that are in most laptops that don't have SSDs. Uh, laptop hard drives are typically the hey, cheapest, mine crappiest. What? Mine has a mine has an SSD in it. Right. 
so before SSDs, laptops would have the crappiest hard drives they could find. And those uh, spin at 5,400 RPM. Uh, so the rotational latency is longer, slower. Uh, now the so this is a crap uh, laptop, and then also uh, high end, high end drives spin at ten thousand RPM. Okay. Now this form of latency is important, uh, yet. As you'll see in our later discussions, we're able to manage it and mitigate that that latency with uh, uh, well-designed disk access software. Uh, one kind of uh, another kind of latency that is far larger is leak latency. So, it, as this is a a disk with concentric rings. Some data is might be located here, and then the next data that you need might be located here. And unlucky you, after getting the data here, then you have to get this data here. So these heads, they move in and out. Uh, initially, on older hard drives, there was an actual motor that would send the heads. So here's the uh, upper head and the lower head. And I better make them the same size because uh, so there's a head and there's a head. Uh, and you are able to read both the top and the bottom uh, in the same cylinder. That's the same track, the same concentric ring. Okay, so there was a motor that actually shoved the heads in like this and then pulled them back out, depending upon what track you wanted. And this linear actuator was enormous. Uh, compare that to a, a record player. Now on a record player, here's your disc, and uh, namely the record, and the record player has a central pivot which puts out an arm, the tone arm, and that rotates in and out. It accomplishes exactly the same function as the linear driver but instead using a, rota uh, a rotating motion. As a consequence, this allowed hard drives to become much smaller. So early hard drives had the linear motion. So the, the disc would be here, and now you can't see the uh, bottom one. Uh, and the, consequently, the size of the hard drive had to be huge to support the in-out motion. But here, the in-out motion is replaced with a side-to-side -side motion, which also allows it to settle over any one of the uh, valid tracks. Okay? So this seek time is potentially huge. So when you're shopping for a hard drive, that's not an SSD, you want to pay close attention to the average seek time. And typically these would be on the order of, I don't know, on the order of five to 10 milliseconds. So if your seek time was on average 10 milliseconds, 
how many total IOs in the best case could you have? How many IOs per second can you do? Three? Jordan? Four? My best guess, three or four. Okay. Well, what's 10, how long is 10 milliseconds compared to a second? Uh, about 100. Okay, so one second is 1,000 milliseconds. Okay, so if your average seek time uh, is 10 milliseconds, on average, the best you can hope for is 100 IOs per second, and that's not very fast. Okay. So what about the best case? The best case of a uh, seek time is going track to track. So remember, you've got concentric rings. These concentric rings are called the tracks. So moving from track 900 to track 901, that is very fast. That's typically far less than one millisecond. So right away, you can see that software plays a huge role in how fast your input output to disk is. I have Go ahead, Jordan. Uh, and please don't answer it if it's too much of a tangent. But how do solid state drives do all this since it's not with a disk? Uh, tune in Tuesday. Roger Dodger. Okay. All right. So what have we studied so far? Uh, we know that disks, uh, moving, moving disks are actually moving objects. And not only does the platter spin, but uh, heads uh, have to move in and out to, to uh, hover over uh, individual tracks on the disk. One more word to look at is the cylinder. For some reason, I can't think of how to spell cylinder. S-C-Y-L-I-N-D-A-R, is that correct? Uh, no. It's I believe it's oh. ER. It is ER. But let's say O really? just in case. Oh, so calendar. Okay. All right. Cylinder. Right. Got it. Yeah, you're right. I, I was conflating calendar. All right. English so a dumb. cylinder. What? English spelling is an abomination to all mankind. Yeah. Don't listen to so, the You add a U into it. Okay. So... Now that you've got, let's get our head around the idea of multiple platters in the same hard drive. They are all spinning on the same axis and they are all spinning together. So there's a concentric ring here and there is the same concentric ring or track here and the same ring here and also on the under, underside. So there's an underside to this one and an underside to that one and an underside to that one. So I have three platters. That means I have six surfaces. And when you're looking at exactly the same track, the same ring, if you look at it vertically, it makes a cylinder. So rotational latency is necessary for the data to come under the head. Uh, and that's going to be exactly the same for all of this, all of the platters. And the uh, seek time to get to that track is going to be the same for all of the tracks in the same cylinder. So once again, software, if the software is designed to recognize, uh, take advantage of cylinders, that means that the total amount that it can read and write with no moving, no movement of the heads is not just the size of one track, but it's the size of all of the tracks.
Okay. So let me draw it for you in a different way. Here's the top platter. And here is the underside of the top platter. So here is one exaggerated track. And one, two, three, yeah, how about just the, what, eight? Eight blocks. So that is a simplification as well. Now, if you number these blocks in the following way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. If you wanted to write 16 blocks at once, you incur the seek time only once if you number the tr number the blocks this way. Okay, so once you seek to this track, you could be writing one through 16, one through eight at the same time as writing nine through 16. So keep in mind that uh, a disk platter uh, is, is 2D, right? but you can also think about all of the platters stacked on top of each other as logically a much bigger track. Understand that? Okay. So, okay, so we've got, uh, studying latency, we've got rotational latency, and then we have seek latency. And there's one more kind of latency, uh, and that is settling latency. So in the scheme of things, this one here, is large. This is a big number on the order of milliseconds. Rotational is small. Latency is small because it's spinning around 5,400 or 7,200 times uh, per minute. Uh, and then smallest of all is the settling latency. But it's still worth mentioning. Now, what is settling latency? Uh, suppose you are currently on this track and the next track you want is here. Well, part of seek time is to accelerate the heads from here, start them hurtling towards the destination. And guess what? Just like space battles in space, which are, are generally not uh, shown very accurately. They're three dimensional. Uh, no, I was going to re refer to the fact that as much as you accelerate, you have to decelerate. So once you pass the halfway mark, then you start decelerating to arrive at the destination. You have to accelerate, then decelerate, and you have to stop over the right track. Now, usually you get very, very close to the right track, but you have to be exactly over the right track, and that is the settling latency. All right? I have a question. Go ahead. So if there are multiple disks stacked on top of each other. Correct. How do you read the different type, like the different sides if there, are, or is there a gap between them? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, there is a gap. And uh, I kind of indicated that here. Yeah. And also uh, here, 
where you see that there, you have to have something that reaches on top and something that reaches on bottom. Yeah, so so basically like the, the reader will just move to the next disc, correct? That must well, be it, really uh, thin though. No, 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 no. I think I know what you mean. Tell me if I'm right. Are you thinking that the heads would retract this way and then yep. go up and down to go out to another platter? Is it, yeah. Or do the de okay. discs move? Uh, in st no, no. The, well, the discs move. They're spinning. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you have if you have a multi platter drive, then let's say this is one drive. This is I'm sorry. This is a uh, one platter. There are three platters here. Then your heads uh, are really exotic mechanical devices. They will look like this. Oh. One up and down, up and down, and then one up. That's weird. Okay. And they will go in and out together because it's one physical piece of hardware. Okay. Not only <laughs> is this exotic, but consider that when something is spinning at 7,200 RPM, there's actually wind in there. There is wind inside the sealed container of the hard drive. And the disc heads are actually designed like airfoils to hover above the surface, but not touch the surface. Because if one of these mechanical parts impacts the magnetic material on a platter, it will actually scrape the magnetic material off. Okay. So uh, disc heads are 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 very very carefully designed uh, uh, pieces of hardware. Uh, they're actually designed to float, fly above the surface of the of the platters. Now that also means uh, that spinning discs are extremely fragile. So I've got my my disc here, and I'm it's spinning, right? It's in my laptop. It's on. My disc is spinning, and then I toss the laptop to my friend, or I toss it on the bed. What's going to happen? Okay, when you were in public school, uh, you know, did you ever spin a bicycle wheel and then try to, uh, you know, rotate it while it was spinning? It resists. So if you jostle a hard drive, the platters are going to resist the movement differently from the heads. And you're in grave danger of impacting and causing physical damage to your hard drive. Okay. So to mitigate that, hard drives have uh, accelerometers built into them. So built into the hard drive is a uh, sensor which will detect if the hard drive itself is in motion. And if the hard drive itself is in motion, it's in danger. So it will order the heads to do an emergency pullback. In fact, uh, the drives that uh, we take apart, they at the spindle, the, sp the spindle of course is in the center, that's the spindle, and the spindle itself is made of a magnetic material. And the, when the heads retract, in the case of this design, the heads are slammed against the spindle and there's a magnetic lock that locks the heads to the spindle so that they don't impact the surface of the disc. Uh, 
Okay, so we've talked about uh, latency of a hard drive. Uh, there's another kind of latency in that it's transfer latency. So transfer latency comes in two varieties. Uh, transfer latency. Uh, no, that was an L, that's a T. Okay, so uh, transfer latency comes from two sources. One is the, the time to read or write the bits off or on the platter. And that's governed by rotational speed. The faster it rotates, the faster you can get it all the bits. The second type is the time to uh, send, receive uh, the bits to uh, the computer. Okay. So uh, this time is uh, negligible. It's just worth mentioning. You're talking about today's SATA drives are six gigabytes per second or more. So this latency is, is pretty much you know, negligible. This one is impacted by the rotational speed. And of course, the rotational latency is based upon the rotational speed. So any questions about where the sources of latency come from? Uh, yes, sort of. Go ahead. So um, if, say, I ask this spinning disk to grab me a 300 megabyte file or something, is it going to do that in one operation or is it like some queue where it's, I'm gonna take X amount of bytes and then I'm going to go to the next process and get its bytes and then I'm gonna to return to you and it's gonna do that over and over again. Or, or is it, I don't know. That, that, well, that's a really interesting question, but the answer is, and it's appropriate answer, a really, really strong, it depends. Uh, uh, so if the hard, yeah, if the hard drive is doing nothing else, which by the nature of your question, it is doing something else. There are multiple users of the hard drive. If the hard drive is doing nothing else, then it can work on your I/O uh, without interruption. But the device itself, keep in mind, it is a shared device. Part of the role of the operating system is to give each process the illusion that it owns the hard drive, but in the reality, it is a shared device. So there is actually scheduling that takes place to decide when a particular I.O. is serviced. Now, in the early days, the scheduling for a spinning disk was done in software. And in fact, the uh, it's it's an interesting study right then and right in and of itself. What algorithm should you use? Should you use the? How did this get? Oh, okay. Uh, let's go back to. So, should you do the shortest peak first? Okay. Should you do the longest seek first? I don't know why you'd want to do that. Uh, should you, um, um, you know, so how do you, how do you manage how to schedule the movement of the heads? And the algorithm that was used most frequently, you'll find that no, no algorithm is perfect, but the one that gives the best overall response was called the elevator algorithm. And this is, when I was an undergraduate, that's one of the things I had to write a disk simulator. So I had to write an implementation of the elevator algorithm. So think about how elevators work. Uh, you're on the middle floor, specifically, you're on the middle floor 
and you push uh, the down button when the elevator is below you. The elevator starts coming up, but for some reason it passes you by and it goes to the floor above you instead of you. Does it ever happen? Okay. So the elevator algorithm is thus, is, is this. Uh, try to extend your, if you're heading in one direction, try to extend that as long as you can. So uh, here's the surface of a disk, and we want to do an I.O. here, uh, here, and here. So the heads happen to be here, and we service that I.O., and we start heading in this direction. And then while we're in this direction, an I, a request for an I.O. happens here. Well, we don't stop the heads. We don't come back and get it, even though we might be in really close. We might, we might, we might not even be there yet, but we've already launched the head and we're going to service this and then we're going to service this and then we'll start going back this way. So the elevator algorithm says service everybody you can in one direction and then service everyone you can in the other direction. So is it like a first in, last out? Is that a good way to describe it or no? Not quite. Um, if, let's say, I wish I could turn that feature off. Uh, so if you were traveling in this direction, so here we are, we're traveling in this direction. Mm -hmm. And before, I was, okay, now we're servicing here. If another IO comes in for right there, it'll do that one. However, it would delay an IO coming in here. Oh. That one would be delayed. Okay, so yeah, it's a little bit different than I thought. Yeah. All right, now you might think shortest seek time first is a good idea. And that is, uh, is your platter. And wherever you are, if there's a request here, okay, then I travel there. And then one shows up here, okay, then I'll go there. And then there's another one here, I'll go there. And then there's another one here, I'll go there. And it's we're always choosing to service the IO next that has the shortest seek time. Now, it turns out that that's not a good algorithm because it means that as long as there's requests, let's say around here, you'll never get to this requests out there, starvation. You'll never get to requests out here, starvation. So the elevator algorithm overcomes starvation, possibility of starvation, because once you head towards the center of the disk, you'll get all the way there servicing all uh, requests in that direction, then you'll turn around and service all of the ones coming back to the outside of the disk. So I, ass I assume it would be the job of the OS to keep track of like, how much, uh, what percent of a given job you have completed. So like, like my, I want to read 20 megabytes. And the, so the operating system is saying, hey, disk, you can read, you should read 10 bytes or 10 megabytes. I don't know how, what the chunk sizes mm -hmm. these days are. And then you can continue to another thing. And then I'll yeah. ask you right. again. Yeah, but the, uh, like I said, it's a giant, it depends, because some uh, hard drives, well, modern hard, hard drives, have the ability to buffer up future commands. So uh, for your 20 megabyte IO, it would break that down into the logical size of the file systems blocks and issue a whole string of commands at once. And then the scheduling firmware on the hard drive 
would figure out the optimal order in which to service those. Okay, so CFIS is a giant, it depends, because it depends on block sizes, it depends on your, the nature of the bus, it depends upon the sophistication of the hard drive, so it depends on a lot of things. But in general, modern hard drives are able to receive many requests, and then it will decide in what order. The operating system doesn't do it. The hard drive hardware decides what order to service the requests in. And it does that optimally. It's, that bottom line is the answer to your question. Nice. Okay. okay. Let's take a look at where to go next. All right, so we've talked about uh, what a platter is. We've talked about what the heads are. Uh, we've seen that blocks, uh, there's a hardware notion of a block. That is the basic uh, size of what can be transferred to the hard drive at once, to or from. And then a cylinder is uh, the concentric, all of the tracks on the same. Uh, ah. Okay, so a cylinder are all of the same track on multiple Platters. All right, we've talked about rotational delay, we've talked about seek delay, transfer delay. Let's talk about thrashing. Okay, anybody familiar with the term? Uh, okay. Yes. I don't know if you, about discs specifically. Well, uh, do you know discs specifically? I don't know what. About thrashing related to discs, I know. Like, okay. See, think I think. Yeah. So imagine, if you will, here is your platter, and I'm on the wrong. Ah, before Thomas was able to tell me, I caught it myself. Okay. Watch out! He's becoming self-aware. <laughs> okay. So suppose you had. Uh, I had. Uh, here's the spindle. Uh, so I have request one, request two, request three, request four, request five, request six, et cetera. So uh, if these requests come in in the right order, in the right timing, the disk heads are going to go zip, 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 right? And this is thrashing that most of the time spent by the hard drive is wasted time. It's wasted in that it's not actually transferring data. That's useful time. Moving the heads, that's wasted time. Right, so, so in a situation like the one that I drew, I've drawn, your performance is going to drop through the floor. It's going to be horrible. It's the worst possible case. Now, when I actually, this is give you some context. The first hard drive that I worked with was not even a disk. In, in rather than being a disk, it was a very large, imagine a full-size refrigerator on its side, drum. So the drum was spinning, spinning around its central axis and the tracks were uh, around the outside of the drum. So this is one track, this is another track. And the head, there's only a single head, because there's only one outside of the drum that it could reach. The head was on a system that moved it the full length of what 
was a full size refrigerator. The speed could not have been amazing. No. <laughs> so, and in fact, uh, the the thing that you know, cool kids such as myself would do, would be place a radio, an AM radio. There's my antenna. You place an AM radio on top of this. And uh, then write a program to move the head back and forth across the surface of the drum. And it put out so much radio interference noise that you could actually play music in static on the AM radio. So, hey, back in the 70s, early 70s, we had a music player. It just didn't sound quite like the music players of today. Okay. Now, so we're talking about thrashing. So that was a creative. Do you know what this is? This was called. I want to look this what? up. Whatever this is. I don't know. It's just what we did. No, like what the drum storage device is called. Do you have it's a name? It's called a drum drum storage device. Look, that that's perfectly good to look it up. Okay. I thought you were like going to be serious. Like that's exactly what we call it, drum storage device. Yeah, it, it is. It's a drum drum storage. All right, drum. Let me see. I'll I'll switch here. Storage for an IBM eleven thirty. Okay, so uh, let's go back here. Uh, So this is the first real computer I used. All right, let me see if I can find a picture of the drum. Uh, I don't see a drum here. Well, I was hoping that uh, I could see the, the drum here. Ooh, this one had a disc. This is a late innovation. So this is a 12 inch disc in a cartridge. So the cartridge is 15 inches wide uh, diameter. It's a CD player. Yeah. Uh, that's the key punch uh, reader. That's a drum plotter. It's very fancy. All right, I'm sorry, I can't find you a picture of the drum. Uh, let's just do images. Uh, that's a key punch machine. No, that's the console. This one has actual discs. So I had one that was really old, I guess. I can't even find pictures of the drums. Well, that was enough of a uh, digression. But anyway, so let's get back to um, thrashing. So I had this creative thrashing by sending on purpose the, the heads back and forth. But later, uh, the computer science department at Stony Brook, the entire department used one hard drive which was the size of a large mini fridge. And it had a uh, door in the top. And inside, you could drop in a cartridge of many platters. The, this one was a Fujitsu Eagle. And it was 500 megabytes. Okay, so I'm not telling you this just to reminisce. I'm telling you this to explain to you how bad uh, thrashing can become. So when this drive was thrashing, because it was overtaxed, 
the cabinet, which I'm tells you is the size of a large mini fridge, would start to rock side to side. And if you do it enough, the whole cabinet would start to walk away from the computer until it pulled the cables tight and it would keep going and it would could actually pull the cable, pull its own cables out. So uh, <laughs> not that I not that I've ever done it. Okay, so that's how bad thrashing can be. Have you ever badly loaded your washer or dryer? and had the whole unit start to rock. You can actually do that with a hard drive. Okay. So thrashing is bad. Where, what did I do with, uh, I guess I went away from uh, the class uh, GitHub. Let me get back there. Okay. So the next subject to talk about, uh, well, let me break for questions. Anybody have questions? Meadow, do you have a question? I hope you do. What's your favorite bike? Favorite bike? Favorite bike, B-Y-T-E. Uh, maybe it's the first. E, E Y T E. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite ASCII character? No. Well, ask me if I have if I have a favorite ASCII character. Do you have a favorite? Yes, Control D is my favorite. It means I'm going home. It means end of file. But you see how easy it is to ask a question. Okay, somebody else, ask a question. Uh, this might cause a digression, but with the older machines that you were talking about, um, what if you, was there any other problems that was the opposite of thrashing? Because that sounds like an extreme on one end. Is there extreme on the other that, that um, is the contrast that you could do that was the opposite? Uh, you know, that is a that is a really great question. That's very insightful. Um, and uh, the answer is yes, there are problems on the other side and uh, the other extreme. And in fact, interestingly enough, it would be worse on today's SSDs to have a hot spot than it was on the old uh, hard old technology. For the full answer to that, you'll have to wait till the next class. Okay. So yes, it's possible to cause damage to the device by uh, by having a hot spot in a small area rather than thrashing from side to side. Would SSDs suffer from thrashing since they're solid state? Uh, no, in fact, let's talk just for a moment about latencies in solid state drives. No moving parts, there's no rotation, there's no seeking, there's no settling. Actually, in reality, there's a tiny bit of settling. Uh, but there, so SSDs are so much faster because there's no moving parts. Right? So you can turn an old laptop into, or an old computer into a brand new machine seemingly by switching out your hard drives to SSDs. However, SSDs do wear out and they wear out because of hotspots, exactly what Rebecca was, was mentioning. Now, let me ask you something. Are SSDs always faster than hard drives? Uh, depends on how new it is. Okay. So 
So you, you're saying it depends. Yeah. Okay, but what does it depend on? That's the danger of answering it depends. Uh, it usually depends on how long and how long and hard that the SSD has been operating compared to a newer, fresher hard drive because an older SSD may have deficiency due to running consistently and will run slower than a new hard drive. In okay. short, wear and tear versus new. Okay. Um, I suppose that's possible. Um, but let's drill down a little bit. Uh, certainly for reading, a, a SSD is always going to be faster than a hard drive. But it turns out that they're often slower for writing. Okay. And that will have to, a fuller explanation of that, we'll have to wait till the next class. Okay. An SSD can be slower for writing than a hard drive. And I say that can be. All right. So uh, the next subject is uh, file systems. And file systems are how we logically organize the data on a storage device. Um, clearly, we have to have some way of organizing the data on a, on a drive, right? I mean, everybody would agree with that. You know, if I want to read the, uh, the fifth block of my file, I don't want to get the 13th block of your file instead. So there's got to be a way of organizing uh, a, a hard drive. And the way that that is, is called a file system. There are many, many, many versions of different designs for file systems, and they uh, try to, a file system design tries to economize on some attribute. For example, um, uh, security or uh, resilience to faults or um, speed, right? So there's different constraints. Each of those factors imposes different constraints on the design of your file system. And once again, a file system is a logical structuring imposed over the physical hardware. So what sorts of things do you think that a file system should do? Okay, so job of the file system. I mentioned a few, but you, you tell me. You are on the other screen. Hmm? You're on the other screen. Uh, okay, thank you. You see, you got me. Okay, what are the jobs of the file system? One. Um, kind of got to guess. Uh, organize in a way that's advantageous to runtime. Okay, so how about uh, organize? Yeah, organize. All right, and then let's drill down. You said for runtime, what do you mean by that? Uh, I meant as in organize the file system, organize the files in such a way that um, I guess it's more that latency that you were talking about where it's, it's going from the, the read to the seek or to the receive. If, they're, if um, the head doesn't have to travel as many spaces because it's organized Good. in such a way, then it will okay. run faster. Good, so we can organize for speed, right? We can organize how else for maximum storage capacity. So good. Excellent. For capacity. Good, good. Keep going. Uh, resiliency. Uh, okay, good for uh, you're asking a lot of me, resiliency, how's that? Uh, that is, there's only one L, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Which I'm very well mind to. Mm -hmm. All right. Are there any other uh, things that are important to how we organize a file system? 
Security. Good. You also have things like administration, write access, read access, different user shenanigans. Yep. yep. So user shenanigans. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. Okay. Anything else? Maybe for simplicity. Well, simplicity to whom? Simplicity hmm. not to the computer, but to the user. Because I feel like okay. everything else you've mentioned, like speed and capacity, are have to do with the computer's performance. But I feel like the organization improves the user's efficacy as well. I don't know. Okay. You're actually driving towards something that I would like to see as the last entry here. Uh, so if, if I can put it in a different words for you. Sure. So how about uh, for flexibility uh, and let's, let's use some of your words, kind of uh, ease of uh, understanding ease, where the file is. Use, the understanding, yeah. Either of those words, ease of use, understanding. Okay, good. This is a good list. So, uh, for example, of this one, for ease of understanding, I would say that uh, the way that directories are put together or organized, right? That exactly. helps you understand. What? That was that is exactly what I was thinking of. That's what I was trying to relay. Right. Okay. Good. Perfect. Uh, all right. So file systems have uh, an important role. Clearly. Uh, let's look at one file system, and that would be the original original. Unix file system. Okay. And the original Unix file system looked like this. These are uh, stretched into a line, all of the blocks on the file system, in the file system, as if there was a linear array. Of course, we know it's not a linear array. It's on a disk, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a uh, a block up front uh, in the file system. That was the super block. Then there was a region that held inodes. And then there is a region that held data. Ugh, it's things like memories. Mm hmm <laughs> I had to implement this. Yep. OK. So. Uh, this is the logical organization of the original Unix file system. If this were the only file system on your computer, on your Unix computer, there would be a block here, and that would be for booting. That's the boot block. And that was block zero of the hard drive, not block zero of the file system. This is block zero of the hard drive. This is block zero of the file system. So the super block is called super. Why? What sorts of information do you think you have to have in order to make use of any file system. So think about it, you're the designer. What Maybe. kinds of information do you have to have? Some sort of like index, right? Well, an index of what? Uh, where everything is. Okay. Like, Here's where the inodes start. Here's where the data starts. OK. Um, well, I know that the inodes always start after the super block. 
So taken care of. But you're on the right track. Keep going. Drill down. Uh, would it be more sort more more of like the data, um, where all the data is kept? Like, I don't know. The no, language, you're on the right track. The language that you're writing on, like it would have to have some type of understanding of what you're putting into it. Ones and zeros. True. Yeah. Well, notice I, I, I tricked Jordan, which is not the first time. Uh, the, um, uh, I should have watched his face when I said that. Uh, so I said <laughs> that I know where the inodes start, right? The you inodes know. start right after the You system. know where they start, but does the computer know? Well, that's by rule. Where do they end? Where do they end? Right, that's totally dependent upon either user choice the size of your hard drive, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in the super block, okay, is number of inodes. And the number of inodes tells us how, lo how long that area is which then therefore tells us where the data begins. Okay, so the number of inodes tells us how long this area is, therefore it tells us where the data starts. What else do I need to know? Go on, go on. Last possible place of data. Like, because the last possible exactly. place. Right. How much data? How big is the data area? Good. That's in the super block. So that gets us to here. Would it keep track of, like, where the uh, disk reader is? Where the, what is? The, the disk reader. The heads? The heads, yeah. That's what I meant. Mm, can you think of a reason why that would be necessary to store in a persistent manner? No, I cannot. Okay. There's your answer. Uh, what else might go in a super block? Okay, if you're on a Mac, go to the terminal. Uh, I'll do it too. So go to a terminal and I'll uh, shift over. I don't actually have a terminal open. Okay. I got one, don't worry. Yeah. You got one, you, you have it for all of us, right? Yes, every single person. Uh, I have the one and only terminal. The, the terminal. Okay, so here's a Mac, and there. This command is called df, and it's uh, disk-free is what it stands for. Now, every one of these lines is a file system. Let me run this again, and notice it says 512 bytes blocks there. So let me run it again with dash h, uh, which is, all right, show me the information in a way that a human can understand it. Okay, so this information is coming from the super block. So the file system has a name. Uh, actually, let's, uh, you know what, scratch that. Let's ignore name. Uh, but it has size and it has a number of inodes that are used, the number of inodes that are free, the number of, I, the percentage of used inodes also has a mount point. We'll have to cover that later. 
how much data is available. Okay. Anything else you can think of that would go, uh, that would be part of a uh, file system super block? Yeah, fine. Um, it would keep track of which blocks are actually allocated or contain memory stuff, things, bytes. Yep, we need, we need to do that. In fact, there are several ways that it's going to be done. So what I'm going to do right now is go over to a toy operating system. Uh, and that would be PKOS. Let's go to... No, it's not there. Where is it? Um, all right, let's see this one. Yeah, let's read this one more fs.h. Okay, so here's a toy operating system. And here is an actual super block. There it is. So it's the size, the number of data blocks, the number of inodes. Uh, this file system has a logging feature. So the number of log blocks. Uh, and then where does everything start? Where does the first block of the logs start? Uh, where does the inode start? And where is the free map? That's exactly what Cephas was talking about. How to keep track of what data blocks are free. Okay, now a, the Linux super block has a lot more in it than this. Okay, so the super block contains meta information about the entire file system. That's the role of the super block. The super block tells you information about the entire file system. And since it's located, it's always the first block of a file system, you know where to find it. It's the first block. Okay. So any questions on the super block? Let's talk about file system resiliency. Taking a look at this picture, if you lost the super block for some reason, what happens? Would the system crash? Uh, you're, it, well, <laughs> it might not crash immediately, but you wouldn't be able to reboot it. Because if you lose the super block, you have no idea where the inodes start, how many there are, where the data starts, how many data blocks there are. You lose the super block, you lose the file system. Okay? So in this design, the one that's on screen, if you lost the super block, your drive was toast. So potentially. A, a, yeah. question, potentially, if yeah. you were trying to do something maliciously, could you do it yourself? Could you like write a program that deletes the super node? Block, super block. Yeah, the super block. Yeah, well, it turns out uh, it depends. Uh, let's go back here and do this DF uh, dash uh, H for humans. And I want you to notice something. Look at how many of these lines have the same size. So there's quite a few. It turns out that a Unix file system or Linux file system uh, has different ways of accessing it 
Uh, if you were to able to write to that file, this is a file. If you were able to write to it, byte zero of that file is the first byte of the super block. So yes, the answer is yes. You could conceivably destroy the file system maliciously. Let's take a look at Okay. And you'll see that only root has the permission to write to these files. So as a owner of you, this laptop, I could become root and then I could blow away the file systems. Will I do that? No. Jordan, what are you thinking? You're thinking how badly you want to do it. I know. Yeah, actually. Yeah. I mean, I would never use my programming skills to hurt other people. Okay. Hey, I have a file I'm going to send to you in a bit. Can you open it up? Yeah, I'll get right on it. It okay. might ask for a permission. Just, just click this. It'll just, be yeah. Fine. Just, just. <laughs> All right, so while we're here, let me show you how to read this. So uh, here is uh, ls minus l of fs.h. This is an ordinary file. So there's permission bits, and that's here. There are nine permission bits. Read, write, execute, read, write, execute, read, write, execute. And uh, let me switch back to the iPad. Uh, iPad, yep. Uh, so RWX, RWX, RWX. So these permission bits belong to the owner. These permission bits belong to a group. And these permission bits belong to everyone else. So uh, the X bit is executable. Executable. Uh, and R and W are read and write. OK. Now notice there are, there are triples and a triple, you don't want to specify, oh, set permission 1001001111. You don't want to do that. So like hexadecimal, we have octal. So here's like the only place in, in where octal comes up all the time. And that is in the permission bits of files. You have three groups of three. So uh, a typical, let's take a look. Uh, let's go back here to the, no, let's go back here to this. So here's a typical file, data file, and it's read, write, blank, read, blank, blank, read, blank, blank. So this is uh, permissions 644. How do I get 644 out of this? Very carefully. What? Very carefully, I imagine. No, it's just the octal representation of. Right. So that. 110, 100, 100. So an octal, three bits at a time. This is six. Four, four. Well, let's take a look at a uh, an executable and see how that would be different. Uh, but first, I'll do this. Well, let me go ahead and do that. Uh, so, do I have a make file here? Okay. So, hopefully, this will make on here. It should. Yeah. All right. So now I've got an executable. 
called PKFS. Let's take a look at that one. That is 755. Okay, so seven for read, write, execute, five for 101 read dash execute, and five again. So if I run this dot slash PKFS, uh, it'll, um, it'll do some magic. But if I remove the executable bit, so I'll make it uh, 644 PKFS. And now I'll try to run it again. Doesn't work. Hey, Professor. Okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to let you know, I had to leave in one minute to go to my next class. Um, oh, shit. What time is it? It's 2.19. It's 2.19. <laughs> oh. Yeah, well, I have to leave for my next class, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. It begs the question, how long would have we continued on? 2.30. I had Probably until the, yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. Probably until the end of the day. All right, Joshua, I'm terribly sorry. Everybody, I'm terribly sorry. But I have to get going, too. Okay. Have a good day. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Bye-bye.